This is Fresh Air. I'm Ken Tucker, sitting in for Terry Gross. My guest Nelson George has just published Hip Hop America, a history of rap and contemporary rhythm and blues that traces the evolution of this music from the late 70s to the present, from the pop rap of Curtis Blow's The Breaks through socially conscious hip hop like Public Enemy's album Fear of a Black Planet to today's gangster rap and beyond. Nelson George was, so to speak, there at the creation. As a writer for first Billboard magazine and then publications ranging from The Village Voice, Esquire, and Essence, he interviewed scores of rap musicians. He's the author of eight books, including The Death of Rhythm and Blues, and is a consulting producer for The Chris Rock Show on HBO. Let's start, as George does in his book, with the Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight, which he cites as the first national rap hit from 1979. The hip, the hip, the hip, 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 hop, you don't stop. Rock it out, baby, bubble to the boogity bang, bang, the boogie to the boogie to beat. Now what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. And me, the groove, and my friends are gonna try to move your feet. You see, I am Wonder Mike, and I'd like to say hello. Or to the black, to the white, the red, and the brown, and the purple, and yellow. But first, I gotta bang, bang, the boogie to the boogie, say... Can you explain a little bit about... Put this in a context of what was going on in black pop music at this time, immediately preceding this, kind of how disco led to the importance of the record-spinning DJ, which in turn led to the development of rap. Well, you kind of said it there. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> you know, disco uh, had made um, the, the DJ as a, uh, a cultural figure really uh, important, both in the uh, black community, Latino community, gay community, across the board. Wherever you went, there were discos, and the DJ, as the arbiter of taste, uh, was becoming a, a very big cult figure throughout mm-hmm. America. So all this stuff, there was disco going on or b- black dance music. Uh, there was a DJ, the cult of the DJ. And what the hip-hop kids were doing, specifically uh, DJs in uh, Harlem and uh, the Bronx, was um, they were g- gravitating to the idea of the DJ as God had DJ as arbiter of taste. Uh, but they had their own aesthetic, which began developing, and that was um, one in which it wasn't so much about playing uh, specific whole records. It was more about playing specific parts of records. Mm-hmm. So they would have taken a uh, a disco record. Let's say they could take a record by the South Soul Orchestra, which was a very big disco group of the era, and they might play just the percussion break that came in four minutes into the record. Uh, and they would play that percussion break and have two records and, and cut between the two percussion breaks so that um, over the course of, let's say, a minute of play, that six or seven minute second section of percussion break becomes extended to become a one minute of almost a new rhythm track. Mm-hmm. So that's really the the building block of hip hop is this idea of taking bits of records, the best parts, the parts that are the most rhythmic, and uh, creating almost new sounds with them. Um, and also it was a kind of music that was truly grassroots. It w- was not relying a- upon the music industry and, and radio. It was, it was music that was creating itself. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a great song, um, actually, uh, back in that period by uh, the average white band. It had Benny King singing with him in this song. It was called Star in the Ghetto. And that basically was what the era of the DJs became. They were stars in the ghetto, literally. Um, in the South Bronx... Uh, in Harlem, then later in Brooklyn and throughout um, Queens, there was this whole circuit of underground. And even underground would even be the right word to say it. Underground suggested it was in, they were trying to. They were just neighborhood spots, mm-hmm. parks, roller skating rinks, um, little discos. Mm-hmm. The first thing that I could find uh, that I, writ- I wrote about rap was uh, for the Amsterdam News, and I think it was from '77 or '78. I don't even have the exact date now, unfortunately. It was in the summer, I know that's for sure, and I was in college. And um, I went up to the Bronx along to see uh, uh, DJ Cool Herc, who's now regarded one of the trilogy of the original hip-hop DJs. It's Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, and Africa Bambata. Mm-hmm. And you, I went to see um, him at this park uh, in the South Bronx. Uh, it's actually a pretty cool story, because I got there just before dusk, maybe about uh, five or so. And... Um, there are kids standing around in this park, the schoolyard, just kind of hanging out, waiting around. And a van pulls up. And uh, out of the van, uh, Cool Herc and a few guys got out carrying crates of records and milk crates, as well as uh, a card table and a bunch of equipment. Uh, they set up, they uh, unscrew the base of uh, a la- you know, street lamp, the base, 
they plugged somehow they rewired the thing so that they plugged in their wires into the wire in the street lamp, and that's how they got their uh, electricity. Uh-huh. And bang, they were uh, doing a concert right there in the middle of the park. Well, let's play one of these uh, kind of fundamental DJs, uh, Grandmaster Flash, who's had one of the longest careers in the genre. Um, let's start by playing a little bit from Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five's 1982 hit, The Message. <laughs> It's like a jungle sometimes, it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. It's like a jungle sometimes, it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. Broken glass everywhere, people pissing on the stage, you know they just don't care. I can't take the smell, can't take the noise, got no money to move out, I guess I got no choice. Rats in the front room, roaches in the back, junkies in the alley with the baseball bat. I tried to get away, but I couldn't get far, cause a man with the tow truck repossessed my car. Don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder. Now, who is Grandmaster Flash, and why is what he did with turntables so important? Well, Flash really uh, was a guy who, along with a, a, another young uh, MC, a Grand Wizard Theodore, um, who took the idea of actually playing the turntables, the idea of scratching, the idea of taking the turntable and the, and the vinyl, and not just playing it in a passive way or even mixing it in, a, in an aggressive way, but to actually rub the vinyl and the needle against each other to create its own percussive sound. Um, that was their concept, and it was quite an amazing... I mean, it's just a weird thing. One of the things about hip-hop throughout its history is that it's been very involved with technology, both recording technology and uh, different kinds of instrumentation. And the idea of turning the actual... turn turntable into an instrument was just kind of an amazing one and it became a staple and it remains to this day a staple of hip-hop DJing and the sound of of hip-hop if anyone says to you the two things about hip-hop anyone will know is a guy rhyming you know throw your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care mm -hmm. and zigga zigga right <laughs> ask anybody about it, and they go zigga zigga and they <laughs> it's that sound and in the way that you think about a rock uh, guitarist and there's certain cliched things that associate with rock and roll uh-huh the Zigga Zigga sound that Flash created is like the cliched sound of hip-hop. Right. Well, so when it came time to actually get this uh, kind of music down on record, Sugar Hill Records was really the most significant first label, I think, for rap. Would you agree? No, absolutely. Yeah. And, and what, what, uh, what was the label significance uh, in, in terms of uh, signing acts and, and getting that music out there to a wider audience? Well, they're the ones who, who uh, put the Sugar Hill Gang record out. Mm-hmm. They're the ones who put out the message. Basically, from about 1979 to 82, they were the hip-hop label, um, both because of the Sugar Hill Gang breakthrough, uh, then also uh, finding some of the other really legitimate uh, stars, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Spoonie G they signed. They also put out the first sort of female MC records, both with a group called Sequence, mm -hmm. which was um, three Thank girls from down, down south. Yeah, And uh, they also later on signed... Um, the Funky Four Plus One, which was a group that had been on a little independent label out of, out of Harlem, and they had the first really, really good female MC on record, which was Shah Rock, who was the Plus One. So uh, they were really significant in getting hip hop off to a start, and really gave hip hop a sense of, uh, of they believed in it enough to be committed to it. And I guess in part that was because uh, the the woman who ran Sugar Hill Records, uh, Sylvia Robinson, had her own roots in uh, soul music, right? She had, yeah, she, well, had, she had pop hits herself. Yeah, she'd had a song called, uh, a very famous one-hit wonder song called Love is Strange, with right. Mickey and Sylvia. Yeah. Later she had a song called Pillow Talk, which was a big hit in the 70s. Yeah. And uh, she and her husband, Joe Robinson, had both had a company called All Platinum Records out of Inglewood, New Jersey. And in fact, uh, the Sugar Hill Gang basically kept them and put them back in business. All Platinum, uh, by 78, 79, had gone into bankruptcy. Um, like many of the, the R&B independent labels of the 70, 60s and 70s, uh, when the big corporations, when you CBS's Warner Brothers, uh, Polygram, got very involved in black music in the 70s, the little, little smaller 
black and white owned independent labels had a hard time surviving. And in fact, it was hip hop in a, in a sense in a, that really gave them uh, a new life and, and, and put them back in business. Uh, I was I was living in Los Angeles in the late seventies when a lot of this music first started. I think, and I think the first song that uh, I ever became aware of as a rap hit was Curtis Blow's "The Breaks." So when I read your book, I was very impressed to learn that you're a background chanter on that cut. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most important early rap hits, and Nelson George is there in the background. Well, what's very funny is um, my roommate uh, at the time, a guy named Robert Ford Jr. Uh, it's a whole tangled story, but I, uh, I was like, uh, he's basically ducking uh, his girlfriend, and I was trying to duck, uh, get out of my mother's house, so we, we became roommates together uh, out in Queens, and at the time, he was writing for Billboard, and he had met uh, Russell Simmons, uh, who was sort of a party promoter in Queens, and Russell had gone to school with Curtis Blow. They were both at City College together, so... Um, through some through the fact that we all were hanging out together, and I was their roommate. I got to hear all these tracks, and I ended up uh, going down to uh, to studio a lot because uh, uh, Robert Ford and another guy at Billboard had put up a lot of the uh, the money to make a uh, first Christmas rapping, uh, and then uh, the breaks, um, and um, that was actually I can remember that day pretty pretty graphically because we're all in this. Uh, it made the track, and they had about I would say fifteen people in the studio with earphones on clapping and chanting, that's the breaks, that's mm-hmm. the breaks. And uh, it's, I, mean, I remember very clearly for some reason it was really a, a nice day and uh, who knew? I used to listen to myself on the radio. I, I, there's one sound I make toward the end of the record where I think I meow <laughs> that uh, you can hear pretty clearly. <laughs> You meow, and then, I don't know, 25 years later, George Clinton is woofing. Uh, there you go. Yeah. I'm talking to Nelson George, author of Hip Hop America. Let's take a short break here. This is Fresh Air. My guest, Nelson George, uh, is uh, the author of Hip Hop America. Um, the next stage of rap was defined in your telling of the story, I think, by Russell Simmons, his Rush management company and the uh, Def Jam record label. And throughout the 80s, Simmons signed everybody, everybody from uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince to Run DMC to LL Cool J, Public Enemy, the Beastie Boys. The, it reads like a who's who of rap. Uh, why was Russell Simmons such an astute arbiter of that kind of musical taste? I just think Russell was one of the first people of the generation to uh, see this as a long-term thing and and to believe in the music. I mean, I remember going with him to meetings or being around, because that time I was at Billboard during this, by this period. I was sort of a black music editor at Billboard from, uh, I think I started in 82. And... The resistance from the established world of black music was very, very uniform. Mm -hmm. The people who were running the Solar Records of the world, Mm -hmm. uh, the people who were running the Philly Internationals, the vice presidents for black music at various labels just were not, didn't believe in this music as a a, a viable thing. They were very locked into rhythm and blues. They believed that rhythm and blues had fought very hard to become a mainstream music, and there was no need for this other thing. Yeah, it was a very, what was predominant on black radio at that point would have been very smooth, ballad-oriented R&B. Yeah, people like, you know, Luther Vandross, uh, Freddie Jackson had a huge run. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the disconnects between the generations and the disconnects in the music was that R&B had become very polished, and not always in a bad way. I think Vandross is a great singer, and I think Vandross is a one of the greatest singers, actually, in the tradition. But overall, the entire framework of what was R&B had lost the guts that it made it soul music in the 60s and into the early 70s. Even funk had really gone, gone out of play. There was a lot of a, a grittiness. Uh, and hip-hop brought back the grittiness to black music. It brought back a sense of street reality. It brought back raw, a rawness and a kind of... Um, Confront- confrontational uh, attitude, which you know you can hear in a Otis Redding's voice, you can hear in a Wilson Pickett's voice, you can hear in a Aretha Franklin's voice. Mm-hmm. So, 
uh, a lot of folks who were running the black music department had, had, what I, had become Cavassier people, as you will. Uh-huh. They, were, they had gold cards and they had uh, houses in the suburbs and they weren't feeling this stuff. And so Russell was a very abrasive young man, very aggressive, and they weren't <laughs> feeling him too much either. Right. Um, Russell's biggest connections and the connections of all the hip-hop people at that time tended to be with people, a lot of the younger white people who might have been involved or aware of coming out of the punk new wave scene. Mm-hmm. So you'd see this connection. I remember hanging out with Russell one night in 70, 84 or so. We went from, we started in Queens at a, at a sort of a roller skating rink, mm-hmm. uh, giving out records. We went all the way up to the Bronx to the Disco Fever, which was uh, a, the core, one of the core hip hop clubs. And then we ended the night down at uh, Haraz. Which was a rock and roll club in the West, which quote unquote, unquote new wave club, uh, in the West um, West Side, and we went to the Peppermint Lounge. We went to a lot of places where there were where people were still listening to uh, the Clash mm-hmm. and, and and stuff like that. And that connection between the uptown hip hop scene and sort of the downtown hipster scene, if you will, was very very important. And now when we talk about hip hop being pop music, it began. The bridge was built then right. between the uptown scene and sort of the progressive wing of white pop music. Right. Well, let's play one of the biggest hits from a Simmons Act run, DMC's Walk This Way, which kind of relates to what you're saying in the sense that it was released in 1986 and it was a collaboration with a white hard rock band, Aerosmith. Uh, and then I'd like to co- you to comment on its uh, significance after we play a little bit of Walk This Way. <laughs> Walk This Way, a uh, collaboration between uh, Run DMC and Aerosmith. Um, was this like the first time that a white rock group had collaborated with a, a rap act? I don't know. I, there might have been other collaborations. I don't want to say that's the first one, but I will say it was the most significant one. Yeah. And um, two things that the, about that record that strike me. One is uh, Run DMC had been always interested in rock and roll. I mean, they did Rock Box before that. Mm-hmm. Um, King of Rock before that also had... Um, Hip had a rock rock guitar influence. Uh, records like Billy Squire's "The Big Beat" mm-hmm. had been a big hip hop record. Uh, uh, there was another record. I mean, "Walk This Way." Mm-hmm. That that section with with the, the drum comes in had been sampled and it was sampled. It hasn't even around yet. But the idea of u- utilized in uh, hip hop DJing for a long time. So there was a con- continuity where working with uh, Aerosmith was not as radical, especially on that particular record, as it may seem, there was a whole historical context for it. Um, and then the other thing to mention is, is Rick Rubin, mm-hmm. who uh, produced the track. And Rick um, had been a rock and roll kid from Long Island who had gravitated to hip-hop for the same reasons. Um, he felt the abrasiveness, the aggressiveness, um, and he had um, hooked up with Russell at one of these downtown clubs that I was just talking about earlier. And they really had a kinship. Uh, actually, Def Jam was started by Rick, in his dorm room at NYU. And mm-hmm. in fact, he's the one who originally signed LL Cool J. Really? Uh, yeah. And he also actually was the key person in, in bringing a Public Enemy into the fold mm-hmm. at Def Jam. Mm-hmm. So Rick was a key person because as a personality and as a record producer, he not only saw the bridges between rock and roll and hip hop, but he helped create the bridge. Well, what was it, do you think, uh, that uh, a, a white audience was getting out of music that was often conceived by black artists for black audiences? I mean, was there an immediate interest in by white audiences to, in, in terms of looking at the commercial potential for rap music? Yeah, I mean, people always say that, well, white audiences discovered hip-hop later. No. Rapper's Delight was one of the biggest records in the country. Mm-hmm. And in fact, Rapper's, it was uh, the year it came out, Nares, which is the Association of Record Retailers, named it Single of the Year for 1979. Um, and in fact, because of the, the weird way the Billboard charts were done in those days, it, it never quite made it to the top 20. But in every other country, including Canada, 
the UK, throughout Europe, it was a top five and even a top ten, top five record. Uh, so the message, again, was another record that had a tremendous white following. There's always been a white audience for hip-hop. And much for the same reasons I believe that, that, uh, that initially, uh, you know, rock and roll, soul music, and then later on reggae uh, had white fans. That there's a certain kind of um, honesty, a certain kind of lack of artifice, which was very prevalent, particularly in the 80s hip-hop, maybe less so now, mm -hmm. um, that spoke to people who were looking for something that was aggressive and, and, and something that was... Uh, didn't seem as polished. And one of the things that happened with R&B is it became so polished that it lost a lot of its youth appeal uh, with young white kids, particularly. So, so hip-hop filled the vacuum. I, I think that sometimes when, when uh, especially a lot of black people talk about white kids liking hip-hop, there's a lot of resentment in their voice. Yes. But uh, as if, the, the, which is funny to me because I remember when, when black people, not very long ago, <laughs> uh, in fact, disdained hip-hop and saw it as... Um, this other thing. In fact, I mean, one of my pet theories is that black people claim uh, claim historically their culture when white people begin liking it. Uh -huh. <laughs> because it, 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 oh, what's going on here? They're stealing our music. Right. Blah, blah. And that's when I'm very protect protective. Exactly. And, yeah. When it's, uh, when it's still kind of uh, disreputable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that goes for blues and that goes for a lot of different kinds of music. Uh -huh. I mean, right now jazz is considered, you know, classical American music. But, you know, that wasn't the case uh, during most of its history. Nelson George is the author of Hip Hop America. We'll continue our interview in the second half of the show. I'm Ken Tucker, and this is Fresh Air. Major funding for Fresh Air is provided by this and other NPR member stations and by Barnes & Noble, booksellers since 1873, online at barnesandnoble.com, AOL keyword BN, and Little Brown & Company, publishers of Blue Light, the new novel by author Walter Mosley, in bookstores. This is NPR, National Public Radio. I'm super fly, super duper fly, super duper fly. Coming up, we'll continue our conversation with Nelson George. His new history of rap music is Hip Hop America. And linguist Jeff Dunberg on why the simplest phrases and expressions can throw off the new automatic translation systems on the web. When the rain hits my window, I take it. Me some endo. Me and Timberland. We sing a dango. We so tight that you get our styles tangled. Sway your dosi do like you loco. Can we get pink at night like Coco? So so. You wanna play with my yo yo? I smoke my hydro on the D-Lo. the keys to the jeep Vroom. i'm driving to the beach top down loud sound see my peace give them pounds now look who would be This is Fresh Air. I'm Ken Tucker. We're talking to Nelson George, who's written a history of hip-hop music. I asked him more about current developments in the genre. As you move into the 90s, uh, an important offshoot of hip-hop is producer Teddy Riley's so-called New Jack Swing. Absolutely. Uh, Riley produced everybody from DJs like Kool Mo D and Heavy D, and he produced uh, uh, vocalists like Keith Sweat and Bobby Brown. Um, let's listen to one of my favorite uh, hip-hop songs of all time, Cool Mo D's How You Like Me Now, and then I'd like you to talk about uh, Teddy Riley's innovations. I throw my tape on, then I watch you three seconds later. I got you shaking your head, dancing instead of sitting. The rhymes kick, the beats hitting you just like... 
like a home run, slamming like a slam dunk. Ride the wave, James Brown, Jay Funk, it happened to James like it happened to me. How you think it feel to see another MC get paid? Using my rap style, and I'm playing the background. Meanwhile, I ain't with that. You can't forget that. You took my style. I'm taking it back, coming back, like Return of the Jedi. Sucker MCs in the place that said I could only rock rhymes and only rock crowds, but never rock records. How you like me now? That's cool, Modi. That's a great record. It really is. I mean, that 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 vocal is like so authoritative, and that drum beat is just so you know pounding. Um, what did Teddy Riley bring to this hip hop party? Well, I mean, as this record sort of illustrates, a couple of things. One is uh, you hear the sampling. He's you know you hear actual sampling, and Teddy was very very an early sampler in terms of using established beats, such as James Brown, which he uses on this record. Yeah, from Night Train. Right. But he also uh, brought another thing, which is also apparent on the record. There was a, a great sense of musicality. Uh, it's not uh, a, a flat... He doesn't just sample and loop someone's beat. The beat is there, but he also mixes in... His keyboard arrangements were quite, quite important and quite, quite smart. He'd been a church boy. He'd been one of those little, little phenomenal kids who played like eight instruments by the time he was like 11. So he had great musicality. Um, and great instances of song. I mean, if you listen to... You know, if you're talking about the vocal... This vocal is really, really arranged. Even the way that Modi comes into the, the first line, uh, mm -hmm. he doesn't just start rhyming, he sort of sings into it. Yeah. Um, and so Teddy is the, is the key guy because he understood music as a true musician, as a true prodigy, and understood hip-hop as a child of growing up with rap records. And he's the first producer uh, that I know of who could blend both, who came out of both, where Rick came out of rock mm -hmm. and brought a rock aesthetic to hip-hop. Teddy brought a, a gospel as well as R&B, as well as hip-hop aesthetic together. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's why he was so influential. He could really produce um, vocals for hip-hop artists as well as produce vocals for singers. And that, was a, that wasn't done at, the, at that time. It was quite unprecedented. Now, everyone does that. Yeah. But Teddy was the first. And Teddy still does it as well as anyone. Uh, there's that great uh, uh, quote from the critic Barry Michael Cooper that you quote in, in your book, uh, uh, Cooper wrote, There's no space to breathe in Riley's music. The orchestration slams you. The drums tear out your heart. Riley's music is RoboCop funk in full effect. Go-Go music gunned down by rap and electronics, then rebuilt with more vicious beats and an in-charge large attitude. That is, that is like great pop music criticism, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Barry, Barry Cooper was one of, one of my f friends and peers at The Voice uh -huh. uh, in the 80s. And Barry did, Barry did an amazing profile of Teddy uh, back around the time of How You Like Me Now right. about Teddy's influence. And uh, it was just a wonderful period, again, because um, Teddy was a person who began to re-inject guts into R&B, um, particularly with uh, the Key Sweat's first album, which is a great record they did together, mm -hmm. and uh, Bobby Brown's um, Don't Be Cruel album. Mm -hmm. With My which, Prerogative. My Prerogative, yeah. Which is just an amazing record, My Prerogative. And uh, Bobby Brown, though now he's sort of become sort of a, a caricature, he's, you know, now he's Whitney Houston's husband, mm -hmm. as, as much as anything, was really uh, and a key, key figure in, in reconnecting rhythm and blues, soul music, and hip-hop. Because Bobby came out of New Edition, which was one of the first groups that really tried to mix the two. He wasn't a great vocalist, but he had a great attitude in his vocal. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the things people don't appreciate about pop singing. You don't have to be a great singer to be a big star. You have to present a persona through your voice. And Teddy was a, had a really, he really mixed in um, a soul man's aesthetic with a hip-hop attitude. Mm -hmm. And so there you had... Um, you know, he's the closest guy I can, you know, I remember from that period going, wow, this guy sounds like he could have been hanging out with Wilson Pickett, uh -huh. as well as hanging out with, with Kumo D. Well, let's play another uh, very different but no less relentless uh, Teddy Riley produced hit. This is Black Street's No Diggity. Hey. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Mm -hmm. I like the play. Mm -hmm. No diggity, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Play on, play on. Yo, Trey, drop the verse. 
It's going down, fade to Black Street. The homies got at me, collab creations. Bump like agony, no doubt. I put it down, never slouch. As long as my credit can vouch, a dog couldn't catch me. Say out. Tell me who could stop with Dre making moves, attracting honeys like a magnet. Giving them orgasms with my mellow accent. Still moving this flavor with the homies Black Street and Teddy, the original rough shakers. Shutting it down, good luck. That's no diggity. I really like the piano on that. Uh, oh, absolutely. Stick. Piano's fantastic. And also the way that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. comes into vocal, that, that arrangement. Again, you hear Teddy's gospel influence. You hear Teddy's understanding of hip-hop. Uh, it's just a wonderful record. And um, the other thing that's interesting is, uh, you know, the vocalist, uh, the uh, rhymer in that was Dr. Dre, mm-hmm. who uh, uh, was also is also one of the best and greatest producers in hip-hop. And... Um, the, the sort of collaboration that goes on in hip hop a lot, where um, there's a great sense now of community. Uh, actually, this particular moment in hip hop is a very good one, uh, in that a lot of the East Coast, West Coast things, a lot of things that had been sort of scarring uh, hip hop le- throughout the mid part of this uh, decade have really faded away. And you see people from all across the board uh, working together, collaborating, East Coast, West Coast, North, South. And there's a lot of sense of uh, community in the music right now, and this record was a reflection of that. Yeah. You write, while Teddy Riley created New, Dra- New Jack Swing, Dr. Dre ruled gangster rap. Uh, from what context did Dre's attitude about hip-hop come from, and why did his production style come to dominate this area of the music? Well, you know, it's funny. Interesting, he's very much an extension of Teddy uh, in the sense that he was very funk-oriented. Not as gospel, not as churchy mm-hmm. uh, as Teddy, and uh, which seems appropriate for the material being rhymed about. Right. Uh, but very, I mean, really a funk a funk finder and a, and a, a person deeply into hip, to uh, P-funk and so on. Um, and a real, again, another really excellent musician. Uh, really good keyboards particularly, which was a very important part of hip-hop. Um, so he, he had a, a, an aesthetic, uh, that was based on a, 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 kind of a country funk aesthetic, you might say. Mm-hmm. Uh, people think of LA as this very, you know, big glamorous city, but, uh, the black, once you get outside of West Hollywood, especially get over to the black sections of town, it's a very Southern feeling city. Uh, and the music that they've always listened to out there, uh, was always a more, a lot funkier than what New York was doing. Um, they were always much more uh, fans of cameo and confunction Barquets, um, a lot of bands that weren't as big in the Northeast but were huge down south. Mm-hmm. Well, you had L.A., which had its own particular urban culture, very aggressive urban culture, had a lot of gang stuff going on. And you combine that with this aesthetic of, of, of funk, and, and that's where you sort of arrive at where uh, Dr. Dre came as a producer. Mm-hmm. Nelson George, author of Hip Hop America, will be back after a short break. This is Fresh Air. Back to our interview with Nelson George, who's written a history of rap music. One of the things your book does is place rap in its social and political context. I mean, when you talk about gangster rap, so much of the public dialogue about this music is condemning its use of profanity and misogyny, and the general idea seems to be to suppress it without acknowledging that this music is reflecting what's going on in young black lives. Uh, Would you agree with that? Yeah, it is absolutely, uh, and to this day, I just saw a review, what did I see the other day? I saw um, someone's record was written about, it was Gangsta Rapper, blah, 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 mm-hmm. Gangsta Rapper. And Gangsta Rapper has become like liberal. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like one of those words you say when you don't want anyone to pay attention to them. Right. Or we know what they're about already. And uh, it's it's really short-sighted. It's really, it, 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 it instead of creating dialogue, it cuts off dialogue. Um, so what these guys actually it's an interesting thing because i know that the a lot of the west coast rappers themselves uh, ice cube and so on tried to get their music called reality rap uh and and that was easy even used that phrase mm-hmm. uh, it didn't really catch on because it wasn't uh, obviously as uh, as charismatic and we love the phrase gangster in anything in america but the truth is that uh the songs had a lot more diversity and they were they had a lot of truth to them 
and and to this day, I mean, there's a lot of uh, what I call wrestling hip hop, mm -hmm. w which would be uh, not not Jesse the Body Ventura stuff, but definitely, you know, we say things to get an effect. Mm -hmm. But at the core of this music is um, a reality of poor working class urban life uh, that this music communicates, and that's why it it will continue to live on. There's always going to be quote unquote gangster rap or reality rap. As long as a percentage of young people, not just black people, but young people in America, live, uh, can't find jobs, have a lot of crime around them, have a lot of police brutality, there's going to be an audience that make this, the people who make these records are going to be an audience that supports these records. And mm -hmm. that's as simple as that. Even to this day, uh, what uh, Master P is doing out of New Orleans, a lot of it deals with this lifestyle. Mm -hmm. A lot of what Jay-Z out of New York, who's had to, had to like the top, record in America for five straight weeks deals with, is quote-unquote gangster rap. If you define it as such, but if you don't listen to the records, you don't really understand what they really mean. Otherwise, you're just taking it as, it's just a slogan. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I don't think we should uh, sort of underestimate the polarizing effect that this, that gangster rap, when it first came out, uh, really had. There's a moment in your book uh, I'd like you to speak about. It's when you say you were on a panel at Spelman College in Atlanta in 1989, and the question of what hip-hop meant and where it was going came up. And you say that you launched into an attack on the two live crew and their raunchy lyrics, and you were surprised that this young black audience started hissing and shouting you down. What was going on in that exchange? Well, I mean, one thing about Luke, Luke doesn't really do what I would call gangster rap. Luke Campbell, the head of the two yeah. live crew. Because uh, he, he, he rarely talks about... Uh, Anything but sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no cocaine being sold. There's nobody being shot. There's there's no drive-bys. There's no uh, uh, racist policemen. <laughs> it's all about women mm -hmm. and big butts. That's Luke's entire. He's the Bob thing. Guccione so, of gangster. He's the rap. Yes, he is. He is. <laughs> so I wouldn't call him a gangster rap. I think that that uh, again, that's where that phrase you use gangster rap. It creates this whole sense of this is what this is. And right. Luke did. And Luke didn't sound like anything that was going out of the West Coast. But in, in any event, uh, that day, uh, I was really struck by the, I don't know if it's generation gap or attitude gap, however you want to look at it, uh, in terms of the way the younger people viewed this music. They viewed Luke as fun. Luke was music to be played at the party Friday night, Saturday night. They weren't that concerned about what he said. Particularly the young women were like, look, I'm not a hoe. Mm -hmm. My friends ain't hoes. So this record's not about me. I don't really care. It makes me dance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from a feminist point of view, <gasps> but, you know, from a party point of view, it was perfectly fine. Uh -huh. So I, I, there was this contradiction, I thought, in a lot of the views uh, of these women, uh, which really disturbed me. Uh, and I've never been a fan of that particular wing of the music, because I do think it, 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 it promotes values and promotes views of women that even these young women were not quite internalizing. Um, it's one thing to have a song you know, that's about a sexy woman. It's another thing to have 12 cuts on an album which are just about, not about her personality, not about, not about romance, not about relationships, just about uh, kind of, kind of beast, bestial activities, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, you know, I just thought this was a bad thing. And I talk about it at length at the book. And um, that Luke was a big part of helping spread. Because mm -hmm. Luke is one of the people who innovated the booty video. Mm -hmm. The video of the girl in the Daisy Dukes shaking her behind, very close to a camera lens, was really Luke's uh, idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's his significant contribution to the culture. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the, they had a very, they've had a very negative effect on, on relations, uh, relationships within the, the black community and, and youth community in general. My guest is Nelson George, author of Hip Hop America. For the mass pop audience right now, I would say the most familiar name in hip-hop is uh, Sean Puffy Combs, who's had hit after hit. Let's listen to a little bit of one of those hits, a song he created with the late Biggie Smalls called Mo Money, Mo Problems. Tell me 
and who rock? Who sell out in the stores? You tell me who flop? Who cop the blue drop? Who jewels got rock? Who mostly goes me down to the blue top? The same old pimp. Mace, you know ain't nothing changed but my limp. Can't stop till I see my name on a blimp. Guarantee a million sales, pull a level up. You don't believe in Harlem world, double up. We don't play around, it's a bet, lay it down. Niggas didn't know me 91, bet they know me now. I'm the young Harlem with the Goldie sound. Can't no PD, hold me down. Cooler, school me to the game, now I know my duty. Stay humble, stay low, blow like hootie. True pimp, spin no dough on the booty. Yell, there go Mace, there go your cutie. Nelson George, what's your take on Puffy? Uh, innovator or fraud or, or what? No, definitely innovator yeah. on a number of levels. Um, just in terms of a, a the marketing of hip hop, um, going back to when he was an intern at Uptown and then later an A and R executive, Puffy was very very smart about imagery. Um, Jodeci, which is a vocal group from um, North Carolina that was on Uptown, came to town in a van. We're trying to get a deal. Had really great voices. Puffy's the one who put them in the baggy outfits, took the shirts off of them made sure they had tattoos, and figured out there's a look there, a way to take this kind of southern soul music look, voices and make them seem R and make them seem hip-hop and cool. Uh, with Mary J. Blige, he's very, very uh, involved in her first two records in terms of creating the look and the attitude of Mary J. Blige that made her like the queen of hip-hop. Um, at, uh, at his own label, Bad Boy, his videos have all been very, very smart, very, very fun, very great eye candy. So A... He's always been very good at understanding how to make this music fun and accessible to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. B, he's... Um, one thing he understood about hip-hop was that hip-hop as pop was to have choruses. Now, the thing about Puffy that, that, leads, that makes people mad is that he takes choruses from other people. Right. That's what I was getting to earlier when I said fraud. People seem to get so steamed when he takes like whole chunks like of Diana Ross out of that uh, pl cut we just played. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I look at it this way. I mean, for someone who grew up or who knows the original I'm Coming Out, maybe it is somewhat objectionable. I don't know. Maybe it was. It's, it used to be initially to me. But the reality is that these records aren't for me. Mm -hmm. I'm a 41-year-old black man. Mm -hmm. They're for someone who's 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, who doesn't know the original uh, and thinks in many cases that some of these things are, are new music. Uh, and... If it's fun to them, if they dance to it, if it if it's if it's making their life better in some way that music does, then it's not a bad thing. As long as uh, you know Bernard Edwards and Nile Rodgers, who wrote the original song, are getting paid, right. as long as Anna Ross is getting paid, uh, and if the kids enjoy it, that's what you, I mean. That's what it's about. Ultimately, it's still fun music. What Puffy does very well is make music that's fun to have have a party with. And when you get to all the politics of hip hop, you get to all the stuff who owns it, black people, white people. When you get to its impact is it, social. The bottom line is this is music that was created initially for parties, mm -hmm. and when it works well, it still works best as music for parties. Nelson George is the author of Hip Hop America.